What is up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast. Hope you're all doing well out there. In this video, we're going to be talking about the latest filings in the U.S. versus Maxwell case. This is going to be Trial Logistics Part 4. I've made three par prior parts before. I'll link them in the top right-hand corner if you want to go check them out. In this case, um, we're going to be looking at the motions in limine that have been filed by Gil and Maxwell's lawyers. Now, this is something I've been expecting for them to file, and they have finally filed it. So we're going to be going through some of the more outrageous requests that have been made to the court by Gil and Maxwell. Well as lawyers, okay. But before that, we're gonna go through all the basics here uh, of the of the system. So, what is a motion in limine? That's the first question, right? So, motions in limine are motions that are made before the trial or during the trial to exclude certain pieces of evidence that either side might argue are too prejudicial, right? And uh, Motions in limine usually come down to what's known as Rule 403 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, and uh, that's detailed right here. And Rule 403 usually comes down to the judge having to weigh uh, certain pieces of evidence as to their probative and prejudicial value, right? So prejudice, as you all know, is a, a piece of evidence that might unfairly um, tilt the jury against the defendant, right? That's what prejudicial means. It's something that that leads to people prejudging and making prejudgments on people without knowing all the facts. So if something is deemed to be too prejudicial, that's something that's unfairly hurtful to uh, the defendant, right? Um, probative, as you can see here, means the ability of a piece of evidence to make a relevant disputed point more or less true. So basically, in layman's terms, probative means anything that fairly represents the case to, uh, to arrive at a just conclusion. OK, it's a fair piece of evidence that's not too prejudicial to the uh, to the uh, defendant. Um, so it's a, so the judge is the one who determines what is and is not probative and prejudicial. And uh, like I said, this all goes back to the federal rules of evidence, which you can download if you like. And uh, you can read we can read a rule 403 in the uh, in the uh, federal rules of evidence. Um, it's right there. Rule 403. And uh, there are some implications that come out of Rule 403 and some standards that have been developed through uh, American jurisprudence. And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a taste and basics of what exactly uh, the judge does. What questions does the judge ask to determine the probative or prejudicial value of a piece of evidence? OK, so we're going to be going through some basics here. Then we're going to be looking at and judging if these are fair requests that have been made by Gill and Maxwell. So let me give you guys some of the standards for Rule 403 and judging what is and is not prejudicial. So Rule 403 is known as the prejudice rule. It says that relevant evidence may be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by any of the three effects that detract from a fair trial. Those, effect, those are unfair prejudice, confusing the issues or misleading the jury, undue delay, wasting time, or needlessly presenting cumulative evidence. So determining the probative value is at the discretion of the judge. And some of the questions that are asked to determine this are the following. How logically related is the evidence to the key disputes? How important is the issue to the resolution of the case? How necessary is the evidence? i.e. how much other evidence with lower prejudicial effect has been already been introduced or will be introduced for remoteness how far removed in space and time from the people places and events being litigated so how remote is the evidence that's being presented if it's something that happened like 50 years ago it might not be as as probative as people want to think right so so these are some of the questions that the judge looks at when he's judging the probative value of a piece of evidence or testimony right rule 403 is most often involved to object that evidence is too prejudicial, this is what the defense does, to be admitted. Determining prejudicial effect of the evidence is also at the discretion of the judge. So probativeness and uh, prejudicialness is both of them are judged by the judge. The extent to which information arouses the emotions of the jury, such as sympathy or bias or hostility, thereby interfering with their ability to reach an impartial verdict. That's something that the judge looks at. So does it ar arouse um, unfair or extreme shocking emotions. That's a question that you ask when you're judging the prejudicialness of a piece of evidence. Two, whether the emotional impact is, is fair or unfair. Emotionalism is fair if it's part of the case and unfair if it's outside of the facts of the case. For example, evidence of child abuse is always emotional because most people are disturbed by children being abused. But whether it is unfairly emotional depends on the case. So 
uh, like this, this has to be parsed out based on a case by case basis, right? In some cases, evidence of child abuse might be directly related to the facts at hand, and sometimes it might be tangential. If it's tangential or overly shocking, then the judge might decide to exclude this that that piece of evidence. But most of the time, in a child abuse case, the emotional impact is a given, and therefore it cannot be excluded as uh, as uh, prejudicial if the defendant is charged with child abuse the emotional impact impact is an inherent part of the trial and therefore cannot be excluded but if the defendant is charged with bur burglary getting the jury all riled up about child abuse is unfair that's a good example so let me give you guys a few more examples of prejudicial pieces of evidence or testimony okay so gang membership is something that's that defense lawyers routinely try to keep out of trial unless it's directly relevant to the case at hand. So the reason is because people generally assume that people who are in gangs or used to be in gangs are violent criminals, and therefore that biases the jury against that person. So gang membership is uh, routinely attempted to be kept out of trial unless it's directly relevant to the case at hand. So this is what they say. Evidence of gang membership or gang activity is highly prejudicial and therefore presumptively violates Rule 403 unless it clearly has significant probative value on a contested issue. Gang membership may be relevant to prove the motive for gang violence or to impeach a witness for bias for the defendant if he is in the same gang or against the defendant if in a different gang. So if a case is about gang violence, then yes, a person's gang membership is relevant and probative. But if they were in a gang like 20 years ago, the uh, the prosecutor can't bring up that fact to you know make him seem like a criminal in the eyes of the jury, right? So so you, most of the time, when, when you're looking at a piece of evidence, you can tell if it's probative or prejudicial. Sometimes it's contested. Some piece of evidence may be both. Um, and it's the, judge's, it's the judge's call to decide whether a piece of evidence will be admitted or not, or a piece of testimony, right? Another example, weapons and drugs possessed by defendant at the time of arrest. Weapons or drugs found in the defendant's possession, home or car, at the time of arrest that were not used in the crime are generally generally inadmissible. To be admissible, they must be relevant to a contested issue other than a description of the arrest. Thus, testimony that when the police arrested the defendant for a robbery, they found four guns in the trunk of his car would not be admissible unless relevant to some contested issue. For example, if the victim said he had been robbed by an armed man who pulled a gun out of the trunk of his car. So, the law is like this in many different parts. Things have to be very specific and related to the case at hand in order for that those pieces of evidence to be admissible in court. So those are some examples of things that may be deemed to be too prejudicial when it comes to um, the judge's decision. But ultimately, it is the judge's decision to determine what is probative and what is prejudicial. Okay, so um, so let's now get to what Gillian Maxwell's side is asking for. Okay, so in their motion of limine, they asked for many different things. I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to go through some of the uh, some of the most outrageous asks that they had. So let's start with four motion to exclude evidence related to accuser number three. So they're referring to minor victim number three or minor victim number three is one of the main people, one of the four main people, the victims that are going to be presented at trial by the government. Clearly, that is part of the government's main case against Ghislaine Maxwell. Therefore, it is definitely more probative than prejudicial for the government to be able to present this accuser. There's almost no chance that uh, Judge Allison is going to exclude one of the main uh, probative witnesses and uh, elements of the government's case. So this... This is ridiculous, and there's no way the judge is going to go for this. Next, motion to exclude evidence of alleged flight. So I think they're referring to when Ghislaine Maxwell was on the run, or that's how the media reported it, and eventually the FBI caught her last year in 2020. Then she was brought up on charges, right? The indictments were filed against her. So I think they want to exclude all um, all media coverage and all allegations that Ghislaine Maxwell ran away from the authorities because she was trying to escape justice and remember that she was hiding out in that house in Ohio. We all remember that. I think they want to um, exclude that evidence. Now, is 
the evidence of flight directly related to the sex trafficking? Well, I think in, in some ways you can argue that it is because she was running away because of her guilt. That's what I'm guessing. That's what um, that's what the prosecution would say. But I don't think that the alleged flight is directly related to um, the charges in the indictment. So I think the judge could have fair grounds to say that, yes, we can exclude the uh, the news stories and um, claims that she tried to run away from the from the FBI and from the from the authorities because it's not directly, directly probative against her when it comes to the sex trafficking charges that have been uh, filed against her. Right. So um, it can go either way. I think you can make a make a somewhat strong case for the prosecution, but I think the defense has a better case because like I said, when it comes to American law, everything has to do with specificity and direct relatedness. So is the alleged flight directly related to the sex trafficking? Not really. You can make a case that she was feeling guilty, so she ran away, but that's not direct relatedness. So I think you can make an argue uh, argument both ways. Um, I The judge has generally been uh, on the side of the prosecution. 90% of the time, Judge Allison has ruled in favor of the government. Some small amount of time, she's ro- ruled in favor of Gillian Maxwell, but uh, this co- could go both ways. So we'll have to see what the judge says on that. Next, motion to exclude evidence of Miss Maxwell's alleged false statements and to redact allegations related to perjury counts from the second superseding indictment. So I think that one is fair. Because the the perjury charges, which she's going to have a separate trial for, have nothing to do with the sex trafficking charges. So I think it's fair to ask for the perjury counts to be excluded from this trial because they have we have a separate trial for the perjury counts. Gillian Maxwell is going to face two trials. OK, I've explained this before. The first trial is for sex trafficking. The second trial is for perjury. And the perjury charges should not be mentioned in the sex trafficking case because the perjury has nothing directly uh, relevant to this trial. So I think that's a fair request because we're going to have a separate um, perjury trial for her lying. <laughs> OK, so those things should be separated from a legal perspective. The lying has nothing to do with the sex trafficking and therefore they're going to they should be separate. Okay, so I don't think that's unfair. I think this should be granted by the judge. Next, motion to exclude items purportedly seized during the search of 358 El Brillo Way on October 20th, 2005. So this is related to Jeffrey Epstein's house in Palm Beach and items that were uh, seized from that house. And they're saying that those items should be excluded. Now, this brings us to a very relevant debate, which is should the charges against Gillian Maxwell be in any way related to the charges against Jeffrey Epstein. Now, we know that she worked for Jeffrey Epstein and the charges allege that she procured these girls for Jeffrey Epstein. So the government is going to argue here that the materials that were seized from Jeffrey Epstein's house are directly related to the case at hand because Jeffrey Epstein and Gillian Maxwell are inextricably inextricably related to each other. Okay, that is going to be the government's argument. And Gillian Maxwell's lawyers are going to argue that what happened back in 2005, what was found in Jeffrey Epstein's house has nothing to do with our client, Gillian Maxwell. She's a separate person and should not be in any way tarred by Jeffrey Epstein's involvement in his case. Okay, so they're going to be trying to run away from Jeffrey Epstein as fast as possible. And this is one of the ways they're trying to do it by trying to say that the uh, that the FBI raid on his house uh, and what they found in his house in Palm Beach, Florida, has nothing to do with their client. Okay, now. This can go both ways, and I'll explain why. Obviously, I think that the evidence that was found in his house uh, has something to do, depending on the evidence, it might have something to do with Gil and Maxwell, but it might also be true that most of the evidence found in his house shows his criminality, right? Because the house was owned by Jeffrey Epstein, not Gil and Maxwell. It wasn't owned by Gil and Maxwell. That's the argument that the defense is going to make, because that's his house, and whatever was found there has nothing to do with this case. From a legal perspective, that argument does have something some teeth. Okay. I'm just being like, I'm telling you guys the law and what is most likely going to be debated uh, in the courtroom. Okay. It doesn't have anything to do with whether I like Gillian Maxwell or not. My videos are, are about the law and what is, what is fair and unfair based on past cases, 
jurisprudence and what the judge is likely to rule, uh, what the judge is likely to look at when she's making her ruling. That's what I talk about on this channel. So when I'm talking about this stuff and I talk about how evidence is favorable to Ghislaine Maxwell, don't mistake that as me saying that Ghislaine Maxwell is a great person. A lot of people tend to make that mistake. I'm not defending Ghislaine Maxwell. I'm explaining the law and what's going to happen in the courtroom uh, when, when these debates come up. OK, so what I'm doing is an academic um, analysis and a legal analysis of the law here. OK, so unfortunately, there's going to be a valid argument for the defense because Gillian Maxwell doesn't didn't own the house in Florida. So the defense is going to say this. This was not her house. And therefore, whatever was found there is only evidence of Jeffrey Epstein's criminality. It is not evidence of Gillian Maxwell's criminality. So that's what they're going to argue here. Again, I'm not sure, exactly sure how the judge is going to rule on this stuff. It is up to the judge. So, you know, I don't know everything about Allison, so I can't really predict either way. But I think it's pretty fair that that Jeffrey Epstein is directly connected to Gillian Maxwell. So not all of the evidence found at his house might be related to Gillian Maxwell, but some of it might be. And I think if it is, the government should be able to present that at trial. Next, we have motion number 10 and the most ridiculous request that will be denied. I can guarantee you about 99% chance that the judge is not going to be done with this. Okay. Motion to preclude law enforcement witnesses from offering expert opinion testimony. What? 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 What did I hear you say? Why? Why? That is ridiculous. It is routine almost in every single criminal trial for the FBI or a local police or state police or somebody that's related to the case to testify, to ask the judge to preclude um, testimony by law enforcement witnesses is ridiculous. Why? What is the rationale for that? There are many FBI agents and police agents that were relevant witnesses to the to the allegations at hand. And therefore, these people should definitely be uh, able to testify at trial. Asking to do otherwise is insanity. Next, motion to preclude testimony about any alleged quote unquote rape by Jeffrey Epstein. Now, this motion goes back to how we determine and how we separate Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Exactly which crimes do we blame on Jeffrey Epstein alone? And which, which crimes do we blame on Ghislaine Maxwell alone and which um, crimes are connected to each other? Because Ghislaine Maxwell procured girls for Jeffrey Epstein. So the government is going to argue, and fairly so, that Jeffrey Epstein's crimes in some instances were directly related to Ghislaine Maxwell's crimes because Ghislaine Maxwell helped Jeffrey Epstein commit the so-called rape that they want to exclude here. So I think the government has a good point when they're when they argue and they will that Jeffrey Epstein's crimes are directly related to Ghislaine Maxwell's crimes. But I think the word rape is overly prejudicial because rape has a lot of emotion attached to it and it would prejudice the jury. And Ghislaine Maxwell is not accused of rape. OK, so if there were charges of rape against Ghislaine Maxwell, then you can use the word rape. And I think it would be fair. But in this case, I would have to say that the defense has a better argument because the word rape carries a lot of baggage, except for the men's rights activists who think that rape is awesome. Uh, most people find rape offensive. So they're going to be prejudiced against uh, the defendant if you call if you associate the word rape with them. So the prosecution is going to argue here that Jeffrey Epstein and Gillian Maxwell are inextricably linked and therefore his crimes are directly related to her. And Gill and Maxwell's lawyers are going to say that Jeffrey Epstein's crimes are his own and that Gill and Maxwell has nothing to do with that. And Gill and Maxwell has not been charged with rape in this particular indictment. Therefore, Jeffrey Epstein's and his rapes have nothing to do with Gill and Maxwell. That's what the defense is going to say. And the prosecutors are going to try to tie her to Jeffrey Epstein. The judge is going to have to determine who has the better argument. I think in this particular case, Gillian Maxwell has the better argument because the indictment doesn't say that Gillian Maxwell raped anybody. The, the indictment here, the first indictment and the second indictment have to do with sex trafficking and perjury. Right. So the judge is going to have to look at the law and the indictment. And um, there there are grounds for uh, for the judge to rule in favor of Gillian Maxwell here. I'm just telling you guys what the law is. OK, but we're going to have to see what the judge does next. A motion to preclude references to the accusers as victims or minor victims. OK, that's just ridiculous because they were minor victims. They were under the age of 18 when they were trafficked by Gillian Maxwell. So by definition, 
factually, they were minor victims. And the word minor victim is not overly prejudicial. The word rape might be overly prejudicial, but minor victim and victims, that's not that's not that prejudicial. I don't think so, right? It doesn't have that emotional punch. The word victim, people use that word all the time. Why, why would that be overly prejudicial? I don't get it. Um, I think it's kind of stupid that they're asking for this. All right, guys. So some those are some of the motions that I want to go through here. As I mentioned, when I reviewed them, there are some grounds for the defense here. Uh, so the judge might have to think through some of these things. Uh, but when it comes to motion number 10 and 12, those are kind of ridiculous. And uh, the government does have some valid arguments when it comes to 8 and 11 as well. But uh, like I said, um, the law has to be very specific and tailored to this specific case and this specific indictment. And Jeffrey Epstein is not overly related to the indictment at hand here. So things that are related to Jeffrey Epstein might be deemed to be overly prejudicial because Ghislaine Maxwell might be prevented from getting a fair trial if you associate her with Jeffrey Epstein, but the government also has a good point because Ghislaine Maxwell is accused of procuring these girls for Jeffrey Epstein. So the government's case is also pretty good. The, the, the defense will try to say that Jeffrey Epstein has nothing to do with this case, but unfortunately he does. So we have to be factual, but we also have to remember that Ghislaine Maxwell is her own individual. So those are things that the judge has to balance when he's looking at these motions. So I tried to explain to you guys both sides of the legal argument when it comes to these motions. The judge is going to be doing a similar weighing of the probative and prejudicial value, as I explained at the beginning. And she is the uh, final arbiter of determining what is probative and what is prejudicial. So I, I, give, I gave you guys some of the uh, lenses that you can look at these motions from, and the judge will be using those lenses as well. Uh, but she is the final arbiter. She'll be deciding exactly what motions are going to pass and uh, which ones are not. Uh, we'll have to see how she rules. And uh, when she comes out with her rulings, I'll be making another video. With that being said, I'll see you guys in my next video. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, press off to get my future videos. If you like my content and you want to support the show, you can do so on Patreon. There'll be a link in the end of the video and also in the description box. You can also join channel memberships down below uh, by clicking the blue join button. With that being said, I'll see you guys all in my next video. As always, peace. It took a great deal of courage for her to confront the man who raped her. To tell him that in America, money and power do not tilt the scales of justice. It is up to the 12 of you to see that for once, she gets justice.